cavernous face, the, the problem of Peel. How you change, how without alienating your own supporters beyond endurance, you change the style of the way in which you're running politics. What he's done, it, it, it seems to me, is this. He, he, he has put this question of style and approach first. Because he sees two enemies, uh, two rivals for power. One is the Labour Party, and the other is the cynicism, boredom, couldn't care less, probably not represented in this room, because he wouldn't be here if he felt that, but very strongly represented in Clare, in Cambridge, everywhere. And he sees that as the first enemy. The first thing you have to do is to interest people. Then you can talk to them about what you propose to do. But if you go on just talking about what you propose to do and nobody is listening because nobody believes in you or believes that you're interesting or important, then you waste your breath. So I think there is a deliberate, criticised, but deliberate and I think intelligent decision to put <coughs> the general approach first and to have the policy later. The general approach means uh, talking about things that the Tory party is not used to talk about. Uh, my son has just become a, a, mem a member of Parliament, um, and he's concentrating on climate change. I would have thought lunatic, been thought lunatic, um, in 1974, uh, my father and grandfather, even more in their time, if I'd said to my constituents, what well, I'm going to concentrate on climate change. You know, he's gone slightly, don't he? <laughs> but now, you know, that isn't so. And, and the, 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 the party is now having to eat and drink climate change. It's become part of the whole setup, And the whole approach to society, the whole approach to the, to the young, the whole approach to, cli cli to crime, and now, I may then say, to some extent, the approach to, to foreign affairs is becoming distinctive. Not yet in terms of precisely what we will campaign on in a general election, which is likely to be three years away, but um, indications. Um, of, of, of a change. And politics, therefore, I think, have become more interesting. And that's the first step. That is an essential first step. I think he has problems which have not yet been fully <coughs> tackled. There's a problem about the war in Iraq because, um, unfortunately, in my view, the Tory leadership uh, approved the war when it began. And there's a certain difficulty in unhooking from that. Probably mainly, not because of any desire to be consistent for consistency's sake, but because there's a sort of basic Tory feeling, which is right, that when you've got troops in action in the field, you don't actually crab them or say anything which will undermine them. The situation has changed now. It's perfectly clear to me, and I talk to the Defence Academy several times a year, and I'm reasonably in touch. It's perfectly clear to me that a lot of the pressure uh, and the anxiety comes out of the armed services now, uh, who, who, who are much more thoughtful and questioning, thank heavens, than uh, they were when I was a national service officer. And it's, it's partly that pressure through families which caused the Chief of General Staff, Sir Richard Downing, to speak the other day, and has caused a new wave of questioning, and caused the Tory party uh, to say, well, there's going to have to be an inquiry, which is entirely right into, into all these matters. But that, that's a problem. Um, Europe is a problem because Europe came very close to destroying the last Conservative government. As I, I remember as the, uh, someone who had to take the Maastricht Treaty through the House of Commons. We, we did it in the end, but the self-inflicted damage was quite considerable. And you still get in the fringes of the Tory party you know, a visceral, in my view, ignorance and prejudice against Europe, which will die away um, by not being fed, but uh, which actually is still there and which he uh, understandably is not very anxious to wake up again. But eventually he will need to make a speech saying, uh, let's forget the old arguments. Um, there's not going to be a European superstate. But here are a certain number of things which I, a young, youngish man, can see have to be done as Europeans if they're going to be done at all. And uh, one of them is climate change. 
international, but you need to be European input. Another is energy, dealing with Putin. I mean, we've lived through an absurd stage, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you know successive European uh, leaders, Berlusconi, Chirac, Blair, Schroeder, went off to Moscow to suck up to Putin individually, competitively, as if that was the way to deal with a cool customer like that. You know, we have to deal with him as Europeans. We have a European problem about energy. He is a key player. He needs us, we need him. Um, but we, we're just foolish. We've been foolish um, in trying to deal with this separately. Uh, and we have to deal with it together. Um, equally now in dealing with Iran, um, you know, we are acting as Europeans. Um, along, not in rivalry, not in hostility to the United States, but doing the diplomatic work which they feel they can't do themselves, the Americans. Um, and these are examples, and there are going to be many more, of things which actually we need to do as Europeans. And this is what David Cameron is going to have to do, to draw a line under all the arguments that I have to deal with. And put, describe it as the future things that we have to do as Europeans. Now I'm allowed, because I have to do all this, I, I'm allowed just one, two reflections. Um, if my grandfather, who lost his two eldest sons, in France in the Great War, um, were to be told that in his grandson's lifetime there would be a Europe which consisted of 25 democracies, practicing, however imperfectly, freedom and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a free economic system, he would have said that this was a dream beyond any possible belief, and yet we have it. You know, and with all the grumbles which are entirely justified in many cases, Unless we have that basic thought in our background, we're just not being historical, we're not making sense. Another thing, more specifically, I remember going through the Maastricht Treaty. I remember the things that were thrown at me by people like Duncan Smith and Tevik the whole time. And I observe now that uh, the Queen is on her throne, reasonably happy, uh, that um, uh, taxes are put up by the Chancellor of the Exchequer from Downing Street, interest rates are put up or down by the Bank of England from uh, Threadneedle Street, and we go to war at the behest of the Americans and not of Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> so every one of the prophecies which were thrown at me in 1992 would have been total wars. I mean, it's just nonsense. So I'm allowed those two reflections. But I'm not suggesting that David Cameron should stump up and down with those <coughs> thoughts. They're backward-looking thoughts, to which I'm entitled. But he has to look <coughs> to the future. 